Welcome to Sideline Sanity with me, Michelle Tafoya, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There really has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, LegacyPMInvestments.com. They're the ones I trust. There are a lot of people out there trying to get you to buy gold. Find out why I trust Legacy Precious Metals. They are a great supporter of the show, and we appreciate it if you go check them out at LegacyPMInvestments.com. Coming up a little segment we're calling Convert Me. Now, I'm not looking really to be religiously converted, but I am curious about faith these days. It's been part of my life. I was raised Catholic, left the Catholic Church, became an Episcopalian. My kids are baptized Lutheran, as is my husband. We go to church a few times a year. But I've met so many people in my life, in business, in sports, who are really open about their faith. And they're really happy and successful people. And I'm wondering what part of their life is really driven by faith. Are they happier because of their faith? Lots of questions. Today's guest, former tennis champion, David Wheaton, who now really lives a life that is all centered around his faith. So I'm going to ask David, hey, convert me. For nearly three decades, she's reported the action from the sidelines. She started very young. She's covered the NBA, NFL, Olympics, and the college football and basketball national championships. And now, during these insane times in our world, Michelle Tafoya thinks we need a serious dose of sanity. This is Sideline Sanity with your host, one of the sanest people on planet Earth, Michelle Tafoya. Well, as a sports reporter, I remember covering David Wheaton as a professional tennis player, beating the likes of Andre Agassi and Yvonne Lendl and a whole bunch of guys. But that didn't fulfill you all together, did it, David? Welcome. I, You know, it's it, it's interesting. The thing that I read was that you sort of had reached a pinnacle moment yep. in tennis, and it kind of came and went, and you thought, uh, is this all there is? Do I have that right? You're exactly right. I, I came to a very life-changing moment, not even at the kind of the lowest point in my life. Sometimes you do some soul searching down at the low moments of your life, questioning your existence and so forth. Where am I going in life? But it was actually at one of the, the pinnacle moments of my life. Um, I was I turned professional when I was 19 years old, um, came on the tour. I was very eager to do well, like anyone would be when they're just starting out. Um, this was back when I was just 22, and I, I qualified for a tournament that year called the Grand Slam Cup in Munich, Germany. And they just took 16 players in this tournament based on how you did in the four Grand Slam events of that year. So by virtue of getting to the semifinals of Wimbledon that year, I qualified for this year-ending event in Munich, which was held at the Olympic Hall, where the Olympics was held in 1972. Now, this wasn't in 1972. I'm, I'm too, <laughs> I'm too young for that. But anyway, <laughs> this is back in the early 90s, and I got into this event. It was one of the largest prize money events, so it was a lot on the line. I was excited just to be there, you know, just just to qualify for it, not thinking that you know I would advance deep into the tournament. I won my first couple matches at the tournament. I was in the semifinals. I beat the Wimbledon champion of that year, which was Michael Stieck. I don't know if you remember that name. I do. But he won Wimbledon. He was from Germany. I beat him in his home country, which is a very exciting. And so that was on a Saturday night. I, I, I get back to the hotel room. I'm excited. I don't fall asleep very well. I have to play the next, the final the next day against Michael Chang, who is an incredibly tenacious player, never say die. And I was working on very little sleep. And uh, went out into the final the next day and just, I don't know, maybe my expectations were low. I'm not sure what it was, but just played one of the best matches of my career. I beat Michael Chang in three sets. And there's this picture of me after the match kind of clenching my fists like this over to the where my family and coaches were and so forth on the side of the court. You know, here I just won the Grand Slam Cup. This is the biggest win of my career. And I shook hands. And there was a trophy presentation, you know, five minutes after the match on the court. And I was holding the trophy like this. Uh, and I distinctly remember this. And I just happened to look ahead of, above the heads of the photographers who were on the court taking pictures of the, the, you know, the winner trophy here. 
And there were you know, 14,000 people there that day in that, that indoor stadium in Munich. And I distinctly remember the, the looking up and thinking, wow, where did everyone go? The, the, the stands had just emptied out within about 10 minutes after the biggest moment of my tennis career. I thought, wow, that really came to an end very, very quickly. And I walked off the court into the locker room. I remember thinking in my mind, well, wait now, how, how am I going to motivate myself to for the next one that comes along, the next tournament that there's not so much fame, fortune, and success on the line? And I, it's, it's that, that tournament started a process of, of soul searching in, in my life. Um, I'll back up just a little bit. I've been raised in a Christian home, so I've been exposed uh, to Christianity and to the existence of God and who Christ was and so forth. But as I got into my teenage years, I, that wasn't important to me. I thought it was kind of boring and it kind of limited the fun I wanted to have. A typical <laughs> teenager would think that. And as I went to college, yeah. same kind of thing. And I began to make a lot of wrong choices in my life, um, relationally, morally, uh, just my heart wasn't right. I, I was on the throne of my life and not God. And so I, I won that big tournament and it was exciting and it was life changing in many ways. But it also, I recognized, didn't offset this deep conflict I felt inside of myself. And the conflict was because, yeah, I was having career success. I, was, I think I was number 12 in the world at the time, doing really well. I was only 22 years old. Yet the same rate inside of me, I had this conflict that I knew I was not right with the God who had created me. And, and that really hounded me, really. And it was, it, was it clear to yeah. you, uh, this, the part that intrigues me about what you just said, you said you knew you were not right with the God that mm -hmm. created you. Some people would say I, something was missing in my life. I knew I wasn't fulfilled. I, but you were talking about a relationship with a deity that you had sort of grown apart from. H how did you know this was about about God and not yeah. just about you, David Wheaton? Yeah, because of what I had been exposed to growing up. Um, and my parents had taught me about God. I, I had been to church and so forth. So I I was familiar with God and the Bible and who Christ is and that kind of thing. But it was at arm's length. It wasn't really, it was more of a family thing. It hadn't become right. a personal thing in my life. So it, it's almost like I knew the way I should go in life. I, I actually kind of believed it intellectually, but I wasn't following it volitionally. I hadn't surrendered. Like I said, I, I was on the throne of my life. I was the one, the captain of my ship, so to speak. Right. It was about me glorifying myself. And that's not the purpose for which God creates every one of us. He, he creates us to know him, to walk with him, to love him, to obey him, to follow him, to worship him, to glorify him. And we're, we're never happy. We're never satisfied, maybe is the better word. We're never fulfilled until we are living within the purpose for which we are created. And so I wasn't in my early 20s. I've been exposed to that. Kind of rejig not re I never stopped believing in God. I would have called myself a Christian in my early twenties, but my life was not being lived in such a way that would that was consistent with you know what the Bible taught, and like I said, morally in every other way that was not living. I was I was living in a way that was in opposition to God, okay. and so I, I knew that. And so you started to deal with that. Well, I, I, this is a big question. But it's, it's one that I always go to. So I have to, in my own mind. So I have to ask you, how do you know there is a God? It's really the most important question. And the first verse in the Bible, do you know the first verse in the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I mean, that really changes everything, doesn't it? I mean, if, if that verse doesn't exist, if there's, if there's no God, who just speaks the world into existence. And as you read more in the Bible, you find he sustains the universe. He determines the times of our times of our lives and the events of the world. And he's the just judge of the universe someday. If he doesn't exist, well, that then we're just on our own to do whatever we want to do. It, it's very consistent to live that way if you don't believe there's a God. Okay, so that, that gets back to, okay, then the Bible. How, yeah. how do you know that the Bible is the root of the way you should live. Like, like yeah. there are a lot of documents in the world and the Bible yeah. is probably the oldest. 
So why is it that the Bible is the one yeah. that you read and trust? Okay, that, that, these are all great questions. Um, let me back up one step, one step to the existence of God. Okay. It's, it's been said by someone that the most important thing about a person is their view of God and whether it's accurate. Because that's going to change everything about you, whether you have, whether you believe in God and whether you have an accurate view of God. Okay, so how do we know God exists? Let's go to that. I I think there's four things that I think of as far as, you know, how we know God exists. They all start with a C. Number one, there's creation around us. Every building has a builder. Every painting has a painter. Every book has an author. Every all information coding has a coder. And our universe, our earth, our bodies are just full of information and design. They just scream design. So really the existence of God from creation alone, you can't know everything about God by creation, but you can know there's a creator. How we live in this little earth in perfect balance in the midst of this infinite universe and it's perfectly suited for life. Really the only, I think, the only reasonable explanation for that, that there is a God. Otherwise you have to believe that nothing somehow came in, came into being into something and exploded by itself into an ordered everything. And, and to me, it's like, I just don't have enough faith to believe that. So there there's creation. The second one is our conscience tells us there's a God. In other words, we all have the innate understanding that some things are right, some things are wrong. I mean, no no one needs to tell you, Michelle, that, you know, it's wrong to murder someone intentionally or to steal from someone. I mean, we, we, or to even to lie. We know this. Who put that in us? There's a law inside of ourselves that was given by the lawgiver. So creation, conscience. And then the third, the third C is Christ. And that he was the son of God. He he was an exact, the Bible says he's the exact representation of God. He he came to earth. Of course, the Bible tells us this. I'll get to that in a second. But he did things that no other human being could have ever done. He walked on water. He raised people from the dead. He rose from the dead. There were 500 witnesses after he rose from the dead at one time. That would stand up in any court of law that saw the risen Christ. And so he did things, said things. He claimed to be the son of God when he was asked at his trial, are you the son of God? Yes, I am the Messiah. I mean, you know, it's either you either take that as like, well, he's either a lunatic or a liar or he's telling the truth. So you go from creation to conscience to Christ. And the final one is what you asked in the question, scripture or or his God's communication to us, which is scripture. So there's an external revelation. There's an internal revelation in our conscience. There's a personal revelation with Jesus Christ. And then there's a special revelation with his communication or scripture. And so you look at, I'll just give you a few things about scripture. Scripture claims to be the word of God. Of course, all scripture is inspired by God. It says no prophecy of scripture came from a human being, but holy men of God moved by the Holy Spirit. And so it claims to be inspired, inerrant, immutable, all those things. But how do we know it's so? I would just say a couple things in in response to that. You look at the unity of Scripture, that a book with 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 years that has one unified message that God exists, man is sinful, God sends a Redeemer, to pay the penalty that man deserves to pay for his own sins and God will consummate all things in the end. But there's this unified message in that book by that many authors over that many years. You also take the the prophecies of scripture. I mean, it's impossible. The, The odds are astronomical that the prophecies in the Old Testament, let's say even about Christ, like Isaiah 53, describing the suffering servant, the Messiah, in just the exact ways he was crucified and buried. Um, I'll give you one more reason. I don't, I have never found anything in scripture has ever been proven wrong. Now you would think in a book that long with that many historical events and names and everything else, that's something to be demonstrably wrong. Now that doesn't mean that you can prove everything right. I can't sit here and prove that God created the heavens and the earth. There is no, there's no scientific experiment we can do to, to reproduce that. But either can the Big Bang Theory reproduce what they're saying as well, too. 
there is a level of faith, but it's not blind faith, Michelle. It's based on reasonable, logical evidence that leads you to a certain conclusion. It's that's a remarkable argument. Uh, it really is. I, I, <clears throat> this is so fascinating to me and so interesting to me. When we come back from this quick break, David, I want to find out how your journey then proceeded after that that really specific moment that you detailed for us, which is so I can see it almost through my own yeah. eyes of, of what you experienced that day on that tennis court. Back with David Wheaton after this. Wow. If money wasn't a major issue in your life five years ago, it's a major issue in your life today. Here we are in 2022. Inflation is through the roof. Gas prices are high. Groceries are expensive. I mean, everything seems to be stressed around the topic of money. And so where does that leave your long-term goals, your wealth, your retirement? How are you going to retire? How are you going to protect your investments? Have you thought about silver and gold? Well, I have, and the company I trust is Legacy Precious Metals, and I'd encourage you to give them a call. Okay, remember 2008? People say this is a lot like then. Now, those who invested in gold saw tremendous gains. Ah, others lost their retirements. So which side of that coin do you want to be on? Pun intended. Check out Legacy Precious Metals. Find out how gold can protect your investments. It can protect your wealth. And it's a hedge against inflation. Give them a call. It's 866-528-1903, 866-528-1903, or download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com. All right, David. So the crowd disappears as quickly as anything. Yeah. You're sitting there going, what just happened? So what happened next? Where, where, where did yeah. your mind take you? I fought it a little bit for a couple of years. You know, I had been going a certain direction in my life, living the way I wanted to live. And but yet I had this conflict going inside of me. And I, I kind of knew inside of me deep down that more of the same, more success, more career success, more making money, more doing the things of, you know, professional athletics was not going to offset that conflict inside of me. So Finally, I just came to a point for the first time in my life that you know, here I was a professing Christian, but I had really never read the Bible for myself. And I could I sensed I had a need to really know what the Bible said. And so I stayed home from the Australian Open a couple of years later after that big win. When I was now I was 24 years old, I was a little injured physically, I had a hip problem, but I think I was more injured spiritually. And I, I stayed home and just day by day, I was single at the time. I sat down at my little desk and I started to read the Bible with a little workbook with it and begin to understand some things in a very personal way that I had not really paid attention to before. It's not that they hadn't been told to me before. It's just that I really hadn't listened or really thought deeply about it and how it applied to me. And the first one was about, you know, who God is. You know, I, I started to understand that God had created me as he creates each one of us to be in relationship with him. That is the purpose of life for us to, to know the one who created us, who gives us our next breath, this, this God who spoke the world into existence, who created us for his glory. And I why wasn't is that, living for- Why is that so important to, to, to have the relationship with him first and foremost? Well, I mean, that's, that's where the whole purpose in life is. I mean, otherwise, if, if that's not your purpose in life to, to know and worship and follow God, then you're really just making it up on your own. You, then, then you are your own God, right? If, if you have no one above you, no one accountable to, um, to in your life, then you're really just, you're really, you're really, you're really just making yourself your own God. I mean, that's the first of the 10 commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that one's such a fundamental one. Like I mentioned earlier, the first verse in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's either true or false. You know, and, and if that's false, I, I'm totally wasting your time talking to you right now. I'm, as it says in the New Testament, we are of all men most to be pitied for any Christian who professes, you know, if God doesn't exist and Christ isn't who he said, to, who, who he, said he is, I, I totally admit I'm wasting your time. I'm a fool for saying what I am. 
but I believe it, uh, that he is who he said he is, the, the creator of mankind. And I believe what the Bible says, that we're, we're called as his creation, that we're accountable to him, we're called to live for his glory. So that's such a fundamental starting starting point, is understanding that that God exists and what who we are in light of that. We're, we're the created, he's the creator. Okay, and so, so I, I interrupted you to get yeah. that answered. I want to go back to you sitting at that desk with a Bible and a workbook and starting to study, and that was your first sort of revelation, yes. if you will. Well, I, I think it was just a, it was a few things that began to understand, just a, a more accurate understanding of who God is. I think I had this perception that God is just maybe this distant, sort of this disciplinarian, um, but that's not what I discovered when I read Scripture, that, that, that God was this a, a loving God who desires to have me in relationship with him. Yes, he's also a just God. He's also a, a God who disciplines those who ultimately reject him. Yes, absolutely true. It's like two sides of the same coin. So I begin to get a more accurate understanding of who this God is as you read through the entire Bible. And then secondly, Michelle, I begin to get a more accurate understanding of who I was. You know, I think I always grew up thinking I'm a good Christian boy and or you compare yourself to other people or you rationalize the way you live your life. But as I begin to kind of read God's laws in scripture and see how I was violating them, I, I realized that, you know, maybe I'm not, or I am not the, the good person I think I am. And you start to compare yourself to like, I say, even the standard of the 10 commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, of course I have many other gods. I have the God of success and, and money and popularity and fame and all these other gods uh, before the true God. You know, honoring my parents, another one of the Ten Commandments. I wasn't honoring my parents. I was I was li really living in dishonor to them in many ways, even though they were constantly trying to help me. I was dishonoring them, you know, uh, morally, uh, just coveting other things in the Ten Commandments. I was a lawbreaker. And the Bible says that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. And this really grabbed me because I realized that I wasn't who I, th I thought I was. And, and that's a hard thing to come to, to realize that, oh, I, I am living in opposition to God. I'm, I'm offending the king of the universe. It's almost like I'm shaking my fist at God and saying, I will rule, not you. And, and you know, any, any just king takes that very seriously, rebellion against him. And so that's the bad news, really. But then came the good news uh, is who Jesus is, why God set Jesus. And the Bible said God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. So it's like God doesn't have to, but he pro provides one way that we can be forgiven. We can be redeemed. We can inherit eternal life through his son coming to earth, living a perfect life, and then dying on the cross to pay the penalty that I deserve to pay for my sins. He paid it for me. I broke the law. Jesus pays the penalty. What a deal that is. And the call is to repent of your sin and put your faith in who Jesus Christ is and what he did for me. That's what, that was the first thing Jesus said in ministry, repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent of your sin and believe in the gospel, which is the good news about who Jesus Christ is and why he came. And so that's what happened when I was 24 years old. I just over that one or two month period of time, I understood better who God is, who I am, who Christ is. And it was at that, that time in my life that I actually took a step of faith and said, this, this, this is true. I, I believe this. I'm going to commit to following Jesus as savior of my sins. Yes, but I'm going to commit to following him as the Lord of my life. And Michelle completely changed my life. I'm, my life went into a U-turn. I didn't become some perfect person at all. I'm not saying that in any stretch, but I had a whole new understanding of being in a right relationship with God that I was forgiven and started to go a whole new direction. That was nearly 30 years ago now. And I, I just have to say that um, my life has been totally transformed because of God's goodness and because of Jesus Christ in my life. How it, it, it an analogy struck me and I yeah. forgive me if this is a terrible analogy, but I think about someone who's deciding to give up 
like they're an alcoholic Mm -hmm. and they decide they've got to give up the alcohol and live without it. And so you think, oh gosh, they can't even have a glass of wine with dinner. This is kind of sad. You know, they're giving up so much in a way I'm thinking, okay, so if you accept God, it's sort of like giving up all the fun stuff and you're living this other way and maybe you aren't having as much fun. This is a really surface view. I, I realize. No, but that's just exactly kind of stri- what I felt when I was in my teenage years, my early twenties. No, you're, you're you exactly like- right. Okay. You're, you're, you're exactly right. It, 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 it is. It, there's that, that thought was going through my mind in my teens, and early twenties. When I came to put my faith in Christ, I knew my life was cha- was going to change. I knew I, I was going to have to give up my sin because that dishonored the one who, who made me. But here's the difference. There is pleasure in sin, but it's just for a season. It's temporary. And, and the enduring consequences aren't worth it. The Bible says, what benefit were you then deriving from the, which the things you are now ashamed for the outcome of those things is death? In other words, I agree. I, I will never tell anyone there's not pleasure in doing what we want to do, pleasure and sin. There is. Otherwise, no one would do it, right? Yeah, yeah. But the joy and the fulfillment and the satisfaction of putting your head in the pillow at night, knowing you're in a right relationship with the God of the universe by repenting of sin and putting your faith in Christ, that's priceless. There, there's, a, there's a satisfaction. There's a joy. There's a fulfillment that in, in that that far outweighs any pleasure to the the momentary pleasures or sins of life that I was partaking in earlier in my life. Hope that answers that. It does. It's I, I, I'm thinking it through. I really am digesting this as you're telling me this. And so how did you see that? Like you said, you put your head on the pillow at night, you know, you have this right relationship, but on a day-to-day basis, how did you see this sort of this new, this U-turn that you made manifesting itself in your day-to-day life and, yeah. and you know, the relationships that you built and the work you began and, and all of that? It took some time for sure, because you're thinking and living one way. You're going one direction for, say, the first 24 years of your life. And then this U-turn is made and you start going in a whole new way. And you're beginning a whole new relationship. And any relationship grows deeper when you spend time in communication with someone. And so as I began, this U-turn was made in my life. As I began to spend time reading more from God's word, the the Bible, begin to hear from him, basically him, his communication to me and to communicate to him in prayer, asking him for help along this road. And importantly, the Bible says when one comes to saving faith in Christ, God doesn't just leave us alone. Like now work it out on your own. No, he gives us that third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to live inside of us, to give us the the desire, um, the, the motivation, the ability, the power to be able to live a life that's glorifying to God that we couldn't do on our own. So all of a sudden, all the temptations that I used to face and succumb to, all of a sudden now I, I found within myself, not me, but I found within myself through the, the power of the, the, the Holy Spirit reminding me what the Bible said, I had the power to be able to overcome what I previously previously could not overcome. Now, again, I didn't become perfect, but it was a whole new direction in my life. And when when I'd fall, um, there was a conviction of you need to you need to confess that, repent of it, and get back up and start going the right way again. And God was giving me the ability to do that. So there, there is a super, I'm not trying to tell you this is like, you know, A plus B equals C. There's some formula, so to speak. But there is a, there's a supernatural element here that, that comes inside of you. And that is the Holy Spirit that gives you the ability to live the Christian life in a way that, that honors God. So the word Christian has come out of your mouth many times. There yeah. are a variety of religions. How mm-hmm. do you square that? with what you believe that some believe in a different God, that some believe in a different way of relating with God? It's a very good question. This is, this is one of the big questions in life. Does God exist? What about other religions? Is there only one way? Jesus said definitively and clearly, I mean, in, in, in several times, and he said in John fourteen six, a very well-known passage, 
I am the way, the in the truth, in the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, just by definition, he's eliminating all ways to God except through him. So to answer your question, what do I think about other religions? I think people can be sincere and I think people can be passionate and I think they can grow up in a certain country or culture or certain religion. But I have to go back to what that says. My only conclusion is Jesus Christ is what he claimed to be, the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to come to the Father but through him. I take that as motivation to tell people about Jesus, to tell them that you can be sincere in a religious belief, but as we all know, we can be sincerely wrong in life too. So I guess I would say in terms of that, that I do believe Jesus is the only way of salvation. He said that, and I believe that. And I just look at it as, as an opportunity to say, for someone who's maybe following the wrong way, I want to compassionately try to persuade that person that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. This is, a tough this one, is, though, Michelle. It's that a tough is a one. Tough I'm not going to sit here and tell you that's easy. There's billions of people in the world. I, yeah. I get the question. I get the question. Yeah, I mean, there, like you said, there are billions of people in the world, and yes. many, many, many of them are Muslims. Mm -hmm. And so what they believe, they believe as fervently as you believe mm -hmm. in your religion. And and I have a hard time squaring that. Like, it's not as though I'm they're competing for my affections. I, I was raised Christian. I'm, right. I believe myself to be Christian. But I, I, I don't want to minimize their belief and suggest that can't two things be true? I don't think so. I, I don't think that there can be multiple ways when Jesus Christ says he's the only way. Again, I do not demean anyone's sincerity in pursuit of God. That's a good thing. Like, even the conversation today, th this is, I applaud you for even having this conversation more we need to have more of these conversations and not push these. This is like the most important topic in life, right? If there's a God, what the Bible says, how can, what does this God want from us? That's a super important, the most important question. So super important topic, but getting to the issue of like, you know, people who are believing something different. Again, you have to go back to what, what, what are they believing? What is a Muslim believing? Use that example. And is it, what is it based on? Is it based on the truth? Is there evidence for that? So I tried to give you some, just some basic evidence for why I believe what I believe. Well, is the Islamic faith based on things that are truthful according to what we see in reality? Again, we can't prove any of these things in a scientific lab. But as you right. look at the various things of, you look at scripture, you look at the person and work of Christ during his life, to me, in my, in my understanding, that is, that is the most truthful thing I know in life. That is reality. And as I look at the, the teachings of Islam, I do not come to that conclusion about who Muhammad was or how you can be reconciled to God through uh, you know, the five pillars of Islam and so forth. Again, that's not meant to demean anyone, but you're asking me a question that I just yeah. think that the Bible teaches the true way to be right with God. It's a fascinating conversation, and you're right. I think there needs to be more of it. I, I I'm watching the world in turmoil. Yes, and it it, it it listen. Much like you, I was raised in a Christian family. Much like you, as a teenager, I sort of went, eh, you know. And I I can say that as I get older and I see more things, I start to think. God, you know, I, I've met so many people in sports, in all walks of life, who wear their faith on their sleeve. They're not shy about it. They believe in it. And they seem really happy about it. Mm -hmm. And it just makes me more and more curious to, to know why. And your story is a great one. And your, your, your conversation was compelling to say the least. Wow. I this is um this is fascinating to me and I so so appreciate your being so candid, transparent, honest about it all. Yeah. And uh I hope we can do it again. 
I, I'd love to do it again. Thank you for inviting me. And I'll, I'll just say, no one has all the answers to some of these really, really difficult questions. I, I can give as good of an answer as I can, but some things, you know, God's, the Bible says that God is, his, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. There's just some things that are beyond our understanding, but I do go back to the authority of what he has said in his word. And that's where I kind of, I truly try to base my, my faith and my thinking and my living. You, you clearly are, are walking the walk. So David Wheaton, it's so great to see you and talk to you. I appreciate you for joining us on Sideline Sanity, trying to bring a little sanity to the world, one one podcast at a time. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Be brave and maybe confront the question of religion in your life. Do good. Um, it, it never hurts to do good in any walk of life. And thanks for listening to Sideline Sanity. Happy to talk once again with Charles Thorngren, the CEO of Legacy Precious Metals. You know, I think it still is confusing to people, uh, some people, uh, as to why a precious metals investment would be a worthwhile one, particularly at this time when they're thinking, I'm doing all I can to put gas in the car. Why is now a particularly good time? A and we'll go from there to how small of an investment is worthwhile for someone? You know, a great question. And, and I think the, the importance of why really comes into the fact that we have to save for ourselves, whether it's a little here, a little there, whether it's making it a plan and putting out so much a paycheck, whether it's making sure we fund our retirement account, we have to realize we are responsible for ourselves in the long run. <laughs> you mean that no one else is going to ride up and save us, you know, on some white steed? It ain't going to happen. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. You know, the, and anyone who's promising to do that is getting ready to take advantage of you in some form or fashion. Yeah. And so, so if, if I'm an investor, a potential investor, and I'm looking at legacy precious metals and I'm saying to myself, yeah, I, I, this sounds smart. I don't have a lot to spend. What would you tell that person? I would say, <clears throat> do what you can. If you never start, you never get there. So the most important step you can take is saying, I'm going to take care of myself and my family. I'm going to make it a plan. I'm going to take action. I'm going to start in the way that's comfortable for me. That's the important thing. The first step is always the hardest. But once you take that first step, the second step is easier. And then you're moving. And then once you're in motion, it's hard to stop you. So that first step, most important step. I always tell people they can call and talk to an IRA expert or, or check out the, the guide that they can download for free, the investor's guide. What, what is the number one question that you get from people who are first time investors? The biggest question I get, is this right for me? That is the question. And that comes from everyone. So, so everyone's asking the same, is this right for me? And yet we're all so unique. And, and yet it, it is a sound investment for just about any portfolio, isn't it? It is. We, even though we're all unique, that uniqueness is going to tailor the way we begin the investment. Okay. But we're all in the same situation. That's the one thing I think we seem to forget in today's society. Whether you agree with somebody or not, we're in this together. America is in this transition that we're in right now. We're dealing with the same issues. Some people like them, some don't, but we're all in it together, right? So the need is the same. How we prepare and how we invest is what changes from person to person, but we all have that same need. It's a great point. And again, I encourage people to, to, to just make the call, pick up the phone. That step is always the hardest. I'm not sure why that is in any kind of effort that you make in life, whether it's weight loss or exercise or investing some way to better your life. It always seems like that first hurdle is, is the challenge. Uh, but when they call, who who are they going to talk to? Who what what's going to be on the other end of the line for them? Great question. You're you're going to speak with one of our customer representatives, and their job is not to sell you metals, right? We have a much different approach. We're going to answer all your questions. We're going to show you what options you have, and on the rare occasion this isn't right for you, we're going to say this probably isn't right for you. Um, we have a gold company here, but you know I, I say it all the time. What we actually deal in is customer service. We want each and every individual that calls to get the answers they need, 
to be able to make the decision that's right for them. And we want to do that in a way that's not pushy, that's not salesy. And, and that's what makes my team so special. We care about each and every caller. And we're going to show you what options you have. And then you get to make an informed decision. So don't be afraid of the phone call. It's the best thing you can do. And this is why I am so honored and I feel privileged to be sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. They're the ones that I'm going to deal with. And I encourage you to pick up the phone, give them a call, even easier. Go check out their their guide. It's a free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com. LegacyPMInvestments.com. But as you said, Charles, pick up the phone. You're going to talk to someone who can answer your specific questions and get get the ball rolling. Get get started. Do something that is a long-term play for your family's benefit. Charles, it's always great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's always great to be here.